Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Biohacking Beauty Podcast, where we explore the innovative ways to enhance your health and beauty from the inside out and from the outside in. I am your host, Amitai Eschel, a co-founder and CEO of Young Goose. And today, uh, joining me once again, due to popular demand, uh, my co-founder and someone I tried to convince that she is the co-host, but for now she denies the title, Anastasia Khojaeva. And so welcome back, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so today let's start with, you know, kind of what the topic of today's podcast is about, because uh, it's been a long time coming. It's been nine months coming almost. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, uh, today we're going to speak about pregnancy and uh, skin changes that occur during pregnancy due to hormone fluctuations. Sounds great. Before we start today's podcast, I would like to... Uh, read a review of one of our beautiful lists. So the review today reads, love the podcast. It has become one of my favorites. So today it's a short and sweet. Uh, if, if you like what you're hearing uh, on this podcast, I would really, really encourage you to take two seconds out of your day and leave a review um, on Apple Podcasts not only that it allows uh, more people to listen to the podcast, to find this podcast out, it also obviously um, helps us kind of stay motivated and continue to create content that um, we know that people like. So that would, that, is, uh, that would help us greatly. Really, even a one-word review uh, is highly, highly uh, valued. So please uh, do us a favor and do that. Um, and yeah, but without further ado, let's start with uh, today's podcast, Anastasia. So again, as I said, uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe um, maybe we should jump kind of right in. Uh, first of all, you are obviously pregnant. Uh, so this is this is why we um, wanted to wanted to record a podcast about it, obviously, since anyone who follows us on, on social media kind of knows you're pregnant. I just came back from... Uh, A4M, American Academy for Anti-Aging Medicine, uh, which is a conference. And uh, everyone, uh, <laughs> people that we don't know, which is kind of kind of interesting, uh, stopped by. They were looking for you, uh, asked how you were doing. And it's, uh, to be completely honest, it's pretty cool that uh, people care about how you're doing. And we don't, we have never actually met them before. Yeah, it's, it's definitely surreal. And... Um... I feel spoiled and privileged and honored. Yeah, so we kind of waited because uh, we wanted to make sure that um, you are having a, a glowing uh, pregnancy, which you are, and uh, that are obviously that our systems work. And uh, we wanted to have the proof in, in the pudding. So the pudding is sitting on me and uh, looks like looking great, great pudding. Um, so we're going to talk today about how to how to maintain our youthful appearance uh, during pregnancy. Some things around it. Um, let's let's start with obviously every everyone knows that uh, pregnancy uh, brings with it the fluctuation of hormones. So maybe we should start there. Like, how do hormones affect uh, the skin during pregnancy? Great question. And uh, I think also, besides my own pregnancy, the the motivation uh, for this podcast was numerous um, times our customers reached out, mm -hmm. uh, letting us know that they're pregnant or breastfeeding and asking um, how can we best support their skin and um, voicing really their skin challenges. Because uh, pregnancy is such a unique uh, experience and some of the ch skin changes we're going to be talking about, you may have experienced during your pregnancy, you might experience in during future pregnancy, or you might not. So we're just going to talk about um, it in general, not only um, as it pertains to me. But in general, um, 
Yes, I'm nine months pregnant. It's uh, surreal to say. 36 uh, weeks and five days, so almost full term, which is 37 weeks. Um, and then the, the due date usually is set to 40 weeks, um, which um, most people know and some people don't, but it's very um, uh, not accurate. Only 5% of women give birth at their 40th week. But um, I'm kind of, I can went off topic here. So speaking of um, hormonal fluctuations, definitely the two hormones that drive actually every single skin change, part of one, which we'll talk in the future, um, will be progesterone and estrogen. So the rise in progesterone and estrogen will be responsible for um, that special pregnancy glow it will also be responsible for uh, potential acne and um, not directly, but um, we'll expand on how it will also be responsible for potential um, mask of pregnancy, which is melasma and hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start with um, pregnancy glow. Just let, you know, maybe we can um, quickly you know, touch on why every one of those things that you mentioned happened. So pregnancy glow, yeah. why does it happen? Like what, what's happened there, happening there that increases the glowing of the skin? Yeah. Two, two things happen. So again, because of uh, the increase in progesterone and estrogen, that in, in, um, in turn drives um, stronger blood flow to your skin. And that will give you that glowing complexion along with um, extra oil production. So you, your skin will also be more hydrated. Mm -hmm. So if um, if just maintain at the right level, you can have all the benefits without all the drawbacks. So okay. you can have this radiant pregnancy glow. Okay, great. And that's a good segue to the, um, to the next question, which is acne. So uh, what's happening that increases that increases the prevalence of acne and maybe the different percentages like how many people yeah. you know will experience acne yeah. pregnancy. um so same two hormones that gave you that pregnancy glow also can give you acne and that uh, happens when the balance um is tilted and now you have over um stimulated oil glands and you produce too much oil because of those two hormones we talked about. And now you're experiencing uh, clogging of pores, which will either worsen your existing acne or can give you acne even if you never had acne. So acne is incredibly common uh, during pregnancy. Up to 50% uh, of women, pregnant women, can experience um, acne during pregnancy. So it's extremely prevalent. So half of the people will experience that. And um, most commonly, um, if you didn't get it in the first trimester, second or third, that's when people get it most commonly because that's when those um, two hormones speak. Got it. Okay, great. I know it's great, but... <laughs> yeah. um, okay, what about the mask of pregnancy, also called melasma, also called, you know, hyperpigmentation. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that. So, um, actually, uh, the minute I found out I'm pregnant, well, maybe not the minute, but uh, once the realization hit and I was thinking of um, the way my body is going to change, what I should do differently, I did think of that dreaded uh, mask of pregnancy. Um, some of my friends that I've witnessed getting pregnant have experienced that even though they had a great skin uh, leading up to pregnancy. So, uh, yeah, so before we're going to talk about how you can potentially avoid it or prevent it, uh, what leads to it is, again, so we have the, the rise of progesterone and estrogen. But that indeed, uh, in turn, um, stimulates uh, mel melanocyte stimulating hormone, which results in extra production of melanin, which then um, shows on your skin as this mask of pregnancy. And the reason um, it's called mask of pregnancy, it's a very specific pattern. So you get it around uh, your mouth, you get it in certain parts of your cheek, cheeks, and you get it like in the middle of your forehead. So it's just really um, a special pattern. It doesn't look like a regular... Um, 
um, it, it's it's quite a unique pattern of dark patches that just color your skin, uh, facial skin. So um, yeah, got it. So we talked about the three things that are more common in the face, like we talked about pregnancy glow, mm -hmm. we talked about acne, and we talked about um, you know hyperpigmentation, melasma, pregnancy mask. What about things that are happening in the, for the skin of the body, such for example, such as stretch marks? Yes, yeah, so stretch marks are incredibly common. And um, so the reason they're happening is um, obviously your belly is starting to accommodate um, and stretch to make room for growing baby. And then the elastin fibers beneath your skin start to break, uh, which results in stretch marks. So while for a very, very long time, the consensus was that it's mostly hereditary and there wasn't so much research about compounds that can support um, elastin fibers to help um, them not break and indeed stretch without resulting in stretch marks. Um, luckily, there are more and more um, compounds being found useful to prevent and stave off of stretch marks. Got you. So basically, um, maybe to, to summarize the the causes that, that you've that you've mentioned. So obviously, we have hormonal fluctuations. Uh, we have increased oil production due to those uh, hormonal fluctuations. For for the uh, for all of the changes. E yes. Yes. And then, um, what about like um, the skin also becomes a little more sensitive and irrit irritable, right? Which would lead to you know, more, more complications, I guess, uh, if you, if you do develop, a, um, for example, if you do develop, uh, acne or if, by the way, if you are overproducing melanin and your skin can irrit you know, increases in irritation, uh, and then we get exposed to the sun, uh, that could also be an issue because part of what causes, you know, excess pigmentation is inflammation and sun damage. So, uh, that definitely, I feel like, is a huge factor, and, and I'm sure we're going to dive into like uh, safe uh, sun exposure during pregnancy. And I think also something that you didn't mention, but it's it's kind of obvious during pregnancy is stress and lack of sleep, right? So obviously, I mean, you had some some experience with uh, with uh, sleep issues during pregnancy, um, and I think stress is like supernatural. Because of that. Yeah, I, I guess um, we, we can definitely say that um, additional reasons for um, acne besides progesterone and estrogen, you know, rising and having that overproduction of, of oil and clogging the pores, definitely stress and lack of sleep will also, um, you know, spike your cortisol and cortisol um, is known to, uh, again, then produce oil and lead up lead to acne. A lot of people that experience um, issues with sleep and stress, it shows up in their skin in multiple ways, um, such as inflammation, as you mentioned, and acne. And yeah, I have, um, I, I mean, I, I only slept well throughout my second trimester. The first trimester was very, very hard to get any sleep and the third one is challenging. Yeah, but I think uh, although you're correct, and obviously, you know, I am somewhat to blame for some of those sleepless nights because I wake up very early. No, no, but that, 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 no, that's okay, not. Okay, let me ask you something. So we we have tried a few things uh, as far as like improving sleep quality. Uh, we tried um, uh, supplements. Mm -hmm. I mean, not every supplement we felt safe to try but we tried some supplements we tried obviously like improving magnesium intake lysine um um some some raw honey to to kind of prevent yeah to uh, to balance that cortisol spike so what, yeah. what we realized uh in the first trimester like a clock i would wake up at 3 a.m fully awake not even like able how can i go able to imagine how can I go back to sleep and then uh, we saw that it's a very common uh, cortisol spike actually not just in pregnant women but a lot of 
people that experience kind of insomnia, anxiety, oftentimes they wake up right there and then um, 3 a.m. it's like this special hour. And, and yeah, it's because of that spike of cortisol. So what we realized um, that uh, taking a teaspoon of raw honey before I go to sleep uh, along with lysine could help. And definitely magnesium was always kind of part of our sleep hygiene. Um, mm-hmm. So we uh, just wanted to make sure we maintain that. Uh, and then also the prenatal supplements, they already contain magnesium. So that that's also like a game of, you know, not giving me too much of things like making, you know, seeing what I'm already taking and what might help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think what's also helped as far as like maintaining, uh, um, you know, um, electrolyte levels, uh, was B minerals, uh, the, the humic and folic acid. Uh, I think we, we saw some, some improvement there, uh, along other things. I mean, less cramping, um, you know, so, so, so in general, that was a good cocktail, if you would. Um, and it, you know, it seems to, to have made a difference. Again, it, it's not easy. It's not hard. It's not, you know, that you're getting uh, uh, perfect sleep all the time. But I feel like in general, we definitely tackled that issue somewhat successfully. Yeah. And uh, also, um... I've I've been the most the most disciplined with meditation throughout mm-hmm. pregnancy. Definitely, that um, that insomnia in the first trimester really motivated me to, um, you know, uh, meditate in the evening, in the morning, um, and also if I would wake up during the night, I would try to meditate to make myself go back to sleep. I've, I've never meditated so much in my life <laughs> throughout this pregnancy. You were a pregnant yogi. Um, okay, so a little bit about the pregnancy mask, which uh, obviously is, I think, the most out of everything um, is probably the the most the thing people are scared of. For sure, about the most. that that was something that I dreaded the most. I yeah. mean, yeah, because I don't know if anyone has ever woken up with a z- with a pimple on their face and asked themselves, "Is that going to stay with me forever?" Right? Maybe when you're a teenager. And you don't know how these things work, but obviously pigmentation is something that people are afraid that it's going to last all their life. So, you know, how, again, let's talk a little bit about how melasma happens or how hyperpigmentation happens and go a little bit into prevention. But maybe we should start about, you know, why does it happen? Yeah. So, um, melasma, just like any hyperpigmentation, will happen when you have a spike um, in melanin production, which is your um, pigment producing hormone. So if you don't have it under control in it, um, there's, there are a couple of processes um, that can press kind of uh, this internal button, button of melanin stimulating hormone, and then it can uh, release melanin production. So you definitely, there is a lot to consider. Mm-hmm. And in, as we spoke earlier, just to uh, bring us back, it, and particularly during pregnancy, this button, what's pressing it is the rise in progesterone and estrogen. It just mm-hmm. activates that mel- melanin stimulating hormone that then, then just releases that extra melanin. So you're very likely, as we spoke, unfortunately, half of pregnant women will develop that melasma. Um, yeah. I think if your if your melanin sites normally are like a cat, you know, you need a lot of uh, coercing in order to to work and create melanin. You know, when you're when you're pregnant, they're more like a dog. You know, you get up on the couch and like, yeah, what's up? Where are we going? You know. So I think it's important to understand that um, although we're we're saying you know this hormone is being expressed, you're going to get more pigment. This is still in relation to stimulation of pigment production. So again, we spoke about sun. Uh, we can speak about other things that might create uh, elevation in pigments, such as artificial blue light. It can also happen uh, through that. Um, so it's important to, to understand that, that there is there is a dance with, with nature and, and what we're doing. So, um, so when does it appear when should people be more concerned with with it within pregnancy? Yes, so it, it it usually appears in the second or third trimester, 
uh, the, the mask of pregnancy usually don't get it uh, in the first trimester. It's much less common. So uh, for me personally, the minute, you know, I, I, as I spoke earlier, I found out I'm pregnant and, you know, started thinking of what changes I should make and, the, and how I should, you know, be proactive. And I, I mean, I've been already really good about protecting my skin from the sun, but I became super diligent. Mm -hmm. So for this whole nine months, I like, I didn't leave my house without a white brim hat. Like it just, you know, I have hats everywhere. I have a couple of hats in the car, I have hats by the door. It's like, <laughs> yes, I just have hats everywhere to remind me to take a hat. If I leave the house, I have like um, fabric hats too that, that you can just fold and put it in your bag um, and have it on the go. Uh, and just for reference, also, uh, we live in Miami, so it's extremely sunny here all year round. So you just are exposed much more to strong, really strong sun. But um, definitely also, I would recommend everyone to wear SPF, at least SPF 30, uh, 30 and up. So our BioShield SPF 40 is um, you know, uh, sun protection factor 40. And, um, I wore it, I wore it every single day. Like I didn't skip even once my SPF and indoors and outdoors. Mm -hmm. Again, um, ours in particular, I, I hate to plug in our product and do a little ad, but it doesn't only protect from the sun. It also protects from EMF and, uh, pollution, which you can still get indoors. We filter air pretty diligently but still yeah. and also of course uh, artificial blue light uh high energy visible light uh which also stimulates uh, our melas melanocytes especially if we're not uh fitzpatrick one so fitzpatrick is a scale of skin color um and when you get higher on that scale it means you're darker so fitzpatrick like three which is you're kind of two or three uh already has very similar reaction to artificial blue light than they would have to um uh uv light as far as as far as melanin production so that's something that we need to bear, take into account the, the, if we're under you know fluorescent lighting or anything like that yeah we definitely have to use some protection against that i i mean uh, uh... Pigmentation uh, runs like in my family. So um, yeah, as somebody who is mixed, I, I, yeah, I just, you know, I have Caucasian and Asian blood in me and both don't do really well with the sun. So I uh, have to be extra diligent, but in this day and age, we're just experiencing a anyone who thought they maybe have innate protection from the sun for one or the other reason should, cannot be as um, naive anymore because, mm -hmm. you know, of the things we spoke so often in this podcast. So I don't want to. Yeah. So anyway, um, we, we, we talked about that when we do go out to the sun, you know, a lot of people, vitamin D is extremely important during pregnancy also not only during pregnancy, but we do need to get some sunlight. We do oh, need to for get sure. Sunlight on us. So what are some of the strategies around that? Yeah. So, um, I, I, yes, I will say that I, I did share it on, on Instagram that, um, I do try to get at least one hour of sunlight. Okay, great. So you plug their product, you plug your Instagram. Great. You're doing great. <laughs> Well, my Instagram is closed. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, what I was saying that I did share about the fact that um, I am super all, all uh, about uh, a daily exposure to the sun for vitamin D production, especially because um, I do believe it, it really helps baby's development. I just will not expose my belly or uh, my face. You know, like I'll just expose my legs, arms. I think that's enough to produce vitamin D. It doesn't have to be the high real estate as, um, yeah, uh, as, as faith. And, and, and also for anyone pregnant or considering pregnancy, I did not expose my belly skin either. Because again, remember, it's, it's very delicate. And I actually something maybe worth mentioning. I do know of uh, people that 
used to suntan when they were pregnant. And um, I believe it also uh, led to them have a higher chance of developing stretch marks because it's, again, extra stress on that skin that's already um, under a lot of stress. And then they developed some pigmentation there that um, that wouldn't go away after pregnancy on their, their body. So just be mindful of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, some of the strategies I did, I, I mean, I didn't go to the sun in the peak hours. So they used to say like the peak hours are from 12 to 2. Now they're saying the skin, uh, the sun is pretty strong even from 10 to 2. So I would go earlier or later. Um, and then again, uh, just, you know, umbrella, uh, if I'm at the beach, um, hat, SPF, and, um, yeah, certain, certain foods as well that mm-hmm. help maintain hydration and, um, contribute to some sun protection, like watermelon, for example, is definitely not like sun protection, but it, it can, it can strengthen it. We actually posted about it on our Instagram, one of the posts. It's like foods that you can eat that supports your skin health. Fantastic. So something that's important to explain about melasma, we're not talking about, you know, pigmented stretch marks, but melasma or pigmentation that was, that has incurred, that you incurred during pregnancy. Most of the time it goes away. Yes. So, um, so the good news, yes, that a lot of the times it goes away as, as fast as a couple of months after pregnancy. Uh, it can stay around though for years, mm-hmm. and um, if that happened to you, and you know it's been years since you were pregnant, and you still have melasma, you have this mask of pregnancy. Luckily, there are um, things that you can consider treatments. Um, so one of the obvious ones is the retinol. It will help um, diminish the appearance of um, sunspots, age spots. You know, and what we're talking about here, I'm melasma. Plug sure of the the angus <laughs> retinol. Yes, yes, you should. If, and if you're going for retinoids, you should really consider bioretinol. Um, then you can also try chemical peels. Actually, we do make professional um, chemical peels uh, with GHKCU available uh, through the spas and medical offices that carry angus. But it is not something you could purchase over the counter because you do need to have a professional apply it. And then there are also lasers, um, uh, different sorts of therapies like that. And actually, um, when you were on the Ben Greenfield's podcast, mm-hmm. you spoke uh, briefly about lasers. But as brief as it was, it uh, caused quite a stir and we have been... Um, getting questions about your opinion on lasers for months. Mm -hmm. And I know you addressed it in a couple of podcasts here and there, but maybe this is a great time to elaborate a little bit on. Yeah, I think especially for someone who's post postpartum and um, is dealing with a lot of things in life, I think it's super important to understand how we approach lasers. So laser is exactly like... uh, I would say the prof, the pro the, the the big leagues of of skin health, and what I mean by that is or skin health appearance, you know. So what I think mean by that is that you are going ahead and creating control damage in the skin, and this definitely we can think of three things that we can we want to consider when we talk about our health. Number one is our peak performance right now, which would, you know, equate to how your skin, how youthful your skin appears right now. Second is, I would say resilience. Okay. So how resilient your skin is to different uh, changes in the environment, stressors, things like that. And the third is this is longevity of the, or the, the accumulation of damage over time. Okay, and even though most of the time we consider these things some kind of combination, like they, we, we view them as one thing. Oh, this person looks so, so young. Probably their skin is also healthy, right? Probably they don't. They, their skin is going to look good for a long period of time. But as we know, uh, that is not the case 
Well, let's give let's give an example from not only from skin from other places in life. You know, professional athletes. Um, obviously, when they finish their careers, in like 30, 35, 40 years old, their body is, is has gone through damage, like someone who's like 50, 60. Um, all, most of them have like hip replacements, knee replacements, um, different surgeries that they that they've had in order for them to perform at their peak performance, they basically burnt out their body. Um, and that also applies to the skin. So we can think of if someone just goes ahead and like pounds their skin with lasers, with radio frequency, with in intense pulse lights, which is called IPL, with different procedures that there are now, like the um, M phase. Uh, all of these procedures, again, are more for peak performance right now, but we're paying for them later on. We need to understand that, and we need and we need to understand that we can go ahead and do them, but this is the price that we pay. Okay, so I'm not against them, but I think there is a price there that people don't understand. And if there is, you know, going back to resilience, obviously resilience. Um, if we if we think of like just um, uh, people who want to use extremely clean skincare products, right? Most of what they are interested in, whether whether consciously or subconsciously, is that skin resilience is not overload the skin with with stimula stimulation is not to kind of weaken the skin right if they expect any sort of like age reversal benefit or anything like that then either they have they're fooling themselves or someone is fooling them i would say through marketing i even think that i i'm not sure i agree with you that they they hope for skin resilience mm -hmm. i honestly think they just really hope for me to maintain the skin as is mm -hmm. and not disturb it yeah that's kind of what i mean by yeah resilience. yeah or or yeah i mean something I, between longevity and resilience i do feel like resilience it's still strengthening uh -huh. the skin uh -huh. and okay. i don't think they can expect okay, or no hope for it. But, but i'm just saying it's not it's not uh group one right it, it's it's uh something uh, between like maintenance, non-disturbance, things like that. Yeah. And obviously longevity is, is, is starting from the inside. It's starting from not kind of raising, you know, uh, as, as uh, our friend Kiran Krishnan um, likes to say, not to uh, have leaky skin um, and uh, supporting, you know, overall inflammation, you know, having a low inflammatory diet, um, all of those things, obviously taking senolytic uh, supplements. Um, obviously, we have a senolytic, senolytic skin serum. But in general, we're talking about, you know, kind of preventing some of the damage that's happening over time. We, we talked about sun exposure, so that's going to be mm -hmm. a strategy for longevity, okay? Preventing or, or avoiding skin damage. Um, now we're going to get back to, to, lay, to all of those highly stimulatory, damage-inducing um, um, procedures. So if we have melasma, if we have something like that, if we just believe that we want a better-looking skin at the moment, go ahead, do those treatments. But you have to, you have to really cross, uh, cross your T's and uh, dot your I's and uh, something with your P's or I don't know what, but you got to understand that everything else has to be dialed in, okay? And, okay, first of all, what I mean by that is that it is not obviously easy to have your sleep dialed in, exercise, nutrition, skincare products regimen, um, and, you know, supplementation, all of that working at the, you know, at the, basically like making sure all, all of that is being done correctly and optimally to support that stimulation and that damage that you've incurred. Um, 
when you're when you're having a newborn, that might not be the best idea because you are creating your you're really depleting that longevity. You're depleting that um, resilience. Okay, you are taking re- basically you're 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 using the reservoir that is intended for these two other categories, right? And I think most women would consider it not really at the stage of newborn. I hope because. As we mentioned, uh, wait wait a few months because it might go away on its own. But yeah, if it's been a few years and you still have that mask of pregnancy, this is when you could maybe resort to some of those um, harsher treatments that Amitai is talking about right now. So do we you... also for stretch marks. I mean, that's yes. also something that, that, that can be done for stretch marks, but kind of the same idea. So, and I'm just curious, um, how would you rate um, the order of what women should go for. So uh, if if it was up to me, I would uh-huh. start with um, retinoids first. Yeah. See if the retinoids help. It's, it's you know, it, it's relative. For some people, um, using a retinoid uh, treatment for, you know, maybe six months um, to a year can, can really help um, lighten that melasma. Mm-hmm. Then personally, my next uh, go-to would be to try chemical pill. Mm-hmm. And only then I would resort to laser therapy. Do yeah. you agree? Would yeah, you agree? yeah, 100%. And also like uh, chemical peels, again, they're a journey in in on themselves. I mean, we have three. <laughs> uh, we have the longevity enzyme peel, which is super, super mellow. Uh, we have uh, copper peptide peel phase one, which is even people with melasma, active melasma, they can do. And copper peptide peel phase two, which is stronger, but you kind of graduate to it. So even within those, there are categories that you can try. Uh, to answer your question, and yeah, and, and then lasers and different types of lasers, uh, whether it is like, um, well, we're not going to get into lasers because this is really something that I prefer you do with a professional, but um, there are different ones uh, in different kind of categories. What I wouldn't do, and by the way, it's really not related really to melasma or hyperpigmentation is uh, radiofrequency and, micro- and, and radiofrequency microneedling. And that's also more related to laxity. It could be used for, for um, stretch marks, but that's more related to laxity. And uh, the reason I wouldn't do it is because it's extremely difficult to, to avoid uh, scarring uh, under your skin and loss of fat tissue. And especially that's something that you need to do over time. So you can uh, do it over and over and over again. And uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So you wouldn't recommend it to treat melasma or ever? I wouldn't recommend it ever. What about if it's done with a professional? I wouldn't recommend it. Well, for sure, don't do it at home. The, the, the radio frequency at home. Because, you know, there are microneedling devices that no, are super popular. Sure, microneedling, just microneedling on its own. It's great. The ones you can do at home, they, they're great and they, you won't be able to hurt yourself really. Um, Just wanted to make sure for our listeners because yes. it, it yeah, could be yeah. confusing as if you say never to do microneedling. No, microneedling you should definitely do. We have, you know, obviously uh, podcasts about that specifically, whether at home or professionals. Microneedling radio frequency is, is something else. It's a delivery method of radio frequency. Um, so that ju- just thank you for that clarification and and also for anyone listening um and you know we we are very happy that we have a lot of new listeners i do want to let you guys know that there was a um two podcast episodes that you can go to to actually familiarize yourself more with these different types of um whether microneedling or microneedling uh, radio frequency, you you spoke about it extensively with Darnell Cox, yeah, um, and then you also spoke oh, with yeah. it w- with Daniela. Um, uh, yeah. So so, do you remember the the the, the <laughs> Okay, well, we, we're going to put it in the show notes, um, those two episodes, just so you can go back to, um, I don't remember their numbers, uh, but we have talked about it um, mm-hmm. in more in depth. Okay, but actually, that's one of the things that I would like to say. Uh, we're co- uh, supplementing on, on collagen is highly beneficial. Uh, and obviously, supplementing on vitamin C, score, sodium ascorbate, calcium ascorbate, not ascorbic acid. Not, not topically, not ingesting it, 
it's poison, so uh, better form of, of uh, vitamin C, which actually leads me to talking about, we mentioned retinoids, yeah. and we've mentioned, you know, collagen breakdown when, it, when we spoke about um, stretch marks. Yeah, so, so when we spoke about um, melasma, the mask of pregnancy, we, we spoke about the fact that um, protecting yourself, uh, your skin from the sun is key mm -hmm. to, to avoid. And then we talk a little bit about the fact that if you already have melasma, um, I mean, during pregnancy, you've developed it or you have it otherwise, um, what can you do to uh, get rid of it? So we spoke about that now. And um, another part of my uh, prevention protocol for melasma was vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, Amitai has recorded uh, an amazing, uh, like one hour and a half long um, <laughs> uh, podcast about vitamin C with Lior Sher, who is uh, um, the world's expert on vitamin C. So um, if you want to know why um, I personally didn't use ascorbic acid, you know, um, as a supplement or topically, you can refer to that podcast, but definitely throughout my pregnancy in general, vitamin C has, as a supplement has so many benefits during pregnancy. So I was supplementing on liposomal, um, sodium, uh, ascorbate. Now in our products, uh, we use, uh, THD, so tetrahedral ascorbate, uh, in our pro care. So that was definitely something it was like every morning was my morning serum that I uh, used underneath my SPF and, um, vitamin C is, is an antioxidant. So it has those properties and it's particularly as it relates to melasma, it also tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So actually it inhibits the melanin production. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can also kind of trick, not trick, but um, hack, you know, we're here biohackers, hack your body not to have that excessive production of melanin when, when it's a, such a sensitive period and it can result in melasma. I would also add, uh, I added uh, acerola, acerola cherries, cherry powder, uh, dry, you know, freeze dried uh, to your shakes tastes great and also is very rich in vitamin C. Again, a natural source of vitamin C. So that's obviously something very positive. You've eaten a lot of uh, citrus. Um, that's what, that kind of was your craving during pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people have asked me like, oh, what have you been craving? And for a while there, I haven't been craving really You're about anything. <laughs> yes, but um, but the tangerines, any kind of citrus fruits were my go-to, and blueberries. I just yeah, and when Rainier cherries were in season. Yeah, that anyway, was yeah. yeah. Rainier cherries. We're thinking of calling the baby Rainier. After, <laughs> okay, anyway, after so, the amount of Rainier cherries. I so uh, let's talk about within pregnancy. You you did mention uh, retinoids and. I think it's a very important decision to make. That's not something we're going to be using during pregnancy. So maybe oh, breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, but you know we, yeah. we, we want to make sure. So let's talk about you know some of the ingredients that we don't want to have in skincare during pregnancy. Yes. So during pregnancy, unfortunately, you have to pause your retinoids. Um, I'm obsessed with our bioretinol. I, I credit a lot of my. Um, skin appearance to the fact that I've been using it, uh, before quite, you know, regularly. So I had to pause that. Can't wait to have it back, but you know, we'll have to wait until I'm done breastfeeding. If you want to know why and what I will just quickly say it's, it's a vitamin A derivative and, um, because it's such a, uh, important, um, natural vitamin that anyway plays a role in baby's development. You just don't want to play with it. Like you, you don't want to alter it, the, the concentration of it in your body. So um, that's why you have to stop with retinoids during pregnancy and breastfeeding. But um, if you want to learn more about why we are not anti-retinoids as, you know, uh, became kind of fashionable to be, you can go back to our retinoid uh, podcast. Uh, so uh, we're on. We, we, yeah, where we talk really in depth and answered a lot of listener questions as they pertain to retinoids. Yeah. 
Now, um, along with retinoids that you can't use during pregnancy, you also can't um, use high-dose um, salicylic acid. Personally, I didn't use low-dose either, but low-dose is considered safe. High-dose um, is not. Um, you shouldn't use hydroquinone. Um, you shouldn't use chemical sunscreens, which we anyway um, against, so like um, oxybenzone. It's a, com a common chemical screen present in chemical sunscreens, which, um, believe it or not, you can, um, you, you really should check your like foundation label. So many, um, cosmetics like foundations and, 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 and primers have chemical sunscreen built in, which is supposed to help you have SPF protection. But a lot of the times it's, it's always not zinc oxide that's mixed with your makeup. So just make sure you don't have that um, in your mm -hmm. makeup. Well, again, like, I want to get into essential oils in a second, but but yeah. but I would say also like phthalates or parabens, things that we really don't see a lot in skincare anymore, uh, are also something that technically, if you're still using products with that, you should stop. Uh, let's talk a little bit about essential oils. Yeah, that that's a surprising one. Um, uh, but there is a quite a laundry list of essential oils that you shouldn't be using during pregnancy. And um, uh, some, of, some of the common ones are like clary sage and clove, um, Cinnamon, yeah. rosemary. Cinnamon and rosemary. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, and uh, do you want to know why? I would love to know why. Let me surprise you. Oh my God. Really? <laughs> why? I, I think that, that, that should be surprising to listeners. But um, yeah, so all those essential oils, it's. Uh, and many more. We're going to put a list. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a staple of, of clean skincare and, uh, you know, how come you can't use it during pregnancy? Um, unfortunately, like those that we mentioned, and there's many, many, many more, um, can stimulate uterine contractions. Um, so, which is a no-no, um, you know, until mm -hmm. the point that you want to give birth. So, um, stay off mm -hmm. okay. during pregnancy. So, uh, fantastic. We are going to put a list because there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So, that's... And all of them are very common, too. A lot of them are very common. The quality of them also matters, not that much, because again, we want it's a good idea to to kind of avoid them in general. But uh, there is something called therapeutic grade in, in essential oils, and um, so in general, the list is going to be um, added, and probably we're going to do something on Instagram too about it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what is safe and effective within within skincare. Uh, for the different things that we've spoken about. So, for example, for acne, what would you say are ingredients that are safe and effective as far as like counteracting acne from your experience, but also things that you didn't use, you know? Yeah, so um, scientific consensus is that you can use glycolic acid and lactic acid. I personally didn't. I just not my types of ingredients for that is in my daily, you know, yeah, leading up to pregnancy kind of, kind of connects to what we said before about like borrowing you know reservoirs that are that, are, that belong to a different system so that longevity or resilience you know use of these acids on a regular regular regular, regular basis kind of depletes those other systems that we have um so i completely agree with you but yeah. they are available i would say also just 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 i would say that salicylic acid is a spot treatment and that's i think a diff, a diff, kind of something that we do need to explain that low dose doesn't mean that percentage necessarily is the only thing that counts. It also is the area of exposure because what we're talking about there is the prevalence of the molecule in the body, right? And so it's, it's, it's also important not to apply it on a too large of a surface area. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, generally, if you're someone who, you know, maybe um, naturally prone to acne and you kind of go hand in hand uh, with um, one of those spot treatments, kind of rollers for, you know, the occasional breakouts, the good news is that you you can use the low dose um uh, salicylic acid for spot treatments during pregnancy. Again, personally, I just 
uh, didn't want to use any salicylic acid. I also have been using before pregnancy a uh, deodorant that has a c- combination of HA and salicylic acid. So DHA, just for people. Yes. And, and uh, I looked at the percentage, and although it seemed safe, right, I, I was like, okay, it goes yeah. right there and, you know, underarms. It's just this area that, um, you know, so, um, like, it allows things in and out much easier, and I just don't want to risk it. So I cut all the salicylic acid personally. And then so uh, actually for me during the first trimester, when that um, hormonal sh- uh, uh, fluctuation started happening, that hormonal shift, I did start noticing that I'm getting that um, extra oil production, and I start getting occasional uh, breakouts here and there. There were not a lot, but um, I saw that I have the potential. Like you know, definitely um, experiencing more um, clogged pores than I did before pregnancy. And then again, before pregnancy, I had my retinoids. Who what? really helps uh, balance oils and keep your pores really unclogged. So for me, it was the green tea. So my first trimester, I used our green tea phyto serum because um, it's antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory. And that really helped um, keep the extra oil. And it's also oil balancing as well. And I think also, if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, even though you have a very sensitive skin and it even became more sensitive during pregnancy, you were playing around with an eye polish, right? Like you were using it very on, on specific areas or using it, you know, for a very short amount of time. But you were you were playing around with that as well, right? I did. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so our exfoliant eye polish has um, is it, really good um, to help anybody who has a buildup in their pores. So I was using it just on my T zone, so the my forehead, my um, on my nose, a little bit on my chin, um, but yes, unfortunately, I just um, in general I have a very sensitive skin, and especially the first trimester, it was yeah I had to kind of like just not yeah. <laughs> okay. experience any any because nail polish also has mechanical exfoliation, and normally it's it's not something abrasive right for a regular person, but uh, the way it felt to me, it was very too scrubby. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so for hyperpigmentation, um, we've discussed vitamin C to kind of prevent uh, uh, tyrosine kinase or the kind of stimulation for melanin production. Um, anything else for? Well, I mean, sunblock, I guess. Yeah. We, we, so, so in terms of what. Okay, in terms of your initial question, like what products worked for me and the ingredients. Mm-hmm. So so green tea fatty serum was my go-to for the kind of the pregnancy acne mm-hmm. um, uh, and preventing that and balancing this extra oil. Um, I use vitamin C religiously um, for multiple benefits, including prevention of melasma, SPF religiously, and then also for extra hydration. So at night, I would use, uh, I would often add bio barrier to mm-hmm. my um, skincare regimen because of that sensitivity that we spoke about. So yeah. to kind of really give my skin that um, extra nurturing, mm-hmm. I would say, um, it really helped. It really, I feel like, uh, balanced my skin microbiome and just restored that balance that was kind of off in the first trimester got it well that is that is fantastic um hyperbaric mask uh as well hyperbaric mask i i just yeah i use it before pregnancy throughout Mm -hmm. it it is not something that you you need to skip that yeah well it also does improve detoxification Mm -hmm. and improves uh, glutathione production so there are a lot there that just make sure your skin is kind of performing in its best. Um, I mean, I was able to keep most of my skincare routine intact. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I've used the same cleansers before our adaptation cleanser. I, you know, used eye care care. Mm-hmm. So okay. those things didn't change. Got it. So for that, biomimetic lipids or biobarrier, 
as far as stretch marks uh what is your opinion did you use uh how did you use them because mm -hmm. your belly looks phenomenal so <laughs> what's going on uh, thank you well um yes yeah, so just like i mentioned the the you know as as we found out we were expecting i was like okay what are some of the things i should you know, prevent, account for, um, and obviously the, the things you dread uh, would be like the melasma and stretch marks. So we already spoke about what they did to prevent melasma. And for stretch marks, um, in my first trimester, I, I was using BioBarrier <laughs> on my belly. I mean, I yeah, it's definitely a big area, um, but that, that was the product I felt... I feel 100% safe using, and I knew that it would be beneficial. And luckily, um, leading to the, the second and third trimester, we already had our yeah. body uh, cream prototype available yeah. for me. So I've been using that religiously. Spilling all the beans here because this product is not out yet on the market. So this product is not out. We will be launching our long, 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 long anticipated asked for um, NAD boosting body cream in 2024. Mm -hmm. And I uh, definitely had the, the privilege to be able to use it throughout my pregnancy and and. Uh, it's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Okay, great. So that is uh, that is all, I guess, for as far as like skincare. Okay, because we've we've basically spoken for an hour, and uh, I don't want people to uh, get. I, I wanted to somewhat stay concise. So let's just wrap it up with some healthy habits outside of skincare yeah. um, to kind of understand how. You really aced this pregnancy as far as like health, really. I think you've you've done a better job than you are doing regularly, and I hope it continues. So, what are some of the healthy habits? You mentioned meditation. Yeah. So, um, products aside for um, skin health, I would say um, again, since uh, you have to be like you know you, you can't use certain certain things, right? Like um, certain strong products and uh, change simulating products. Uh, something that I became more consistent is um, using like ice rollers or washing my face with really, really cold water. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, I always knew that it's great and I've done it, you know, from time to time here and there, but um, I never had the need to do it as consistently. So that was something that's not product related, but uh, beneficial for skin health and one of the um, habits I incorporated. I will also say that obviously um, meditating and improving sleep quality helped maintaining the skin health. And um, in general, um, I also have been the most consistent with uh, workouts than ever. I know it's um, it's a kind of like a paradoxal. Uh, but, um, yeah, during this pregnancy, I just realized that I want to prepare my body. I'm, I'm trying, preparing for natural unmedicated birth. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a whole separate, you know, topic not related to skin health. But um, it takes a village uh, to prepare uh, in just the way births are, how they're medicalized um, in today's world. You just have to consider so much uh, in terms of how you can best prepare your body and, and um, specific workouts and movement um, and having them consistently is just crucial. Um, but then um, as a side effect, a pleasant side effect, uh, uh, movement and workouts is really good for your skin. Uh, we talked about it um, in the podcast with Amber um, mm -hmm. Amber Burger recently, but yeah, it stimulates blood flow. It helps detoxify your skin, um, and it, again, it balances also cortisol. That we already said that it's not good for your skin. Um, so the, the workouts have been crucial. I think going to the beach. Um, obviously, we, we mentioned the hours, but also grounding on the sand. Uh, it definitely gives you pleasure, which is important. Yes, and, and I would say uh, prenatal prenatal yoga. 
Yeah. It's a, it's a running joke in this house that it's just relaxing in different positions. But I think that's, that you've been super consistent with that. And, and I think, uh, you know, that, that's whether it is mental, physical, whatever it is, it is another great tool uh, for consistency. I think habits may be, obviously, we can control many things. Uh, I think we covered in this podcast anything from what if something happens like acne and melasma and stretch marks to how do we prevent it. Um, understanding that things will happen, our body, you know, your body will do its thing and we're only here to make sure that we're doing the best with it is very important. Um, and I think the mental aspect is really even more important than the physical aspect. I mean, you ace this pregnancy in both ways, uh, but I think the mental aspect is even more important than the physical aspect. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, it, it's it's been a journey, and uh, but um, something I'm already grateful for is that definitely it helped me to instill some of the healthiest habits. Something. Um, that I, yeah. I wanted to say that, you know, I'm consistent and I work out nearly every day and it hasn't been the case before pregnancy, but it became the case during pregnancy and meditating and also, um, eating healthy. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's the healthiest I've ever eaten. Like we eat really healthy mm -hmm. in general in the house, but you know, knowing like, oh, the baby's developing this week liver and this week his kidney and this is the neural development like and just having all that you this know week he's developing his eyelids oh no i don't want him to be with messed up eyelids i need to eat healthy yeah and and, and just what you um end up needing to consume to best support your baby uh some of the healthiest things um you yeah. need to eat so uh I, I didn't do it for myself but i ended up doing it for this baby I'm growing, so. Yep, now, yeah. And, and all of those things, you know, healthy diet, uh, meditation, uh, consistent workout will benefit your skin health, so. Mm -hmm. So these if you are... don't care about your baby. <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Anastasia, listen, we, this has been, uh, we've passed an hour. Okay. Which, uh, I don't mind, but you seem to mind, so. Uh, Thank you very much for this, uh, I think, uh, pers very personal podcast, right? Like we talked about something that you're going through personally. And uh, it's uh, pretty cool to share with the world a little bit. Uh, please do continue uh, if you see us, uh, if you see me, to ask me how Anastasia is doing. Uh, she gets a report on the amount of people that asked how she's doing when she's not there. So and and I, I really do feel um, loved and um thank support it so thank you to everyone who cares thank you yes um and uh yeah thank you everyone for listening to this podcast uh even if you are not pregnant or have someone pregnant in your life it's also kind of a general knowledge and, and understanding how hormones affect our skin and what we can do you know around it um but yeah that's all we have for today today since it's only anastasia, anastasia and myself there are no uh q a in the end of this uh, episode and then we answered a lot of listeners yeah, questions that pertain to yes. this topic yeah, for sure what i would say is this if you have a question that you would like us to answer the best way to make sure it is answered in in a pod, in a podcast episode that relates to it is uh to ask it in a review on you guessed it on apple podcast so uh it, you know, obviously reviews help tremendously growing this podcast, reaching more people. Imagine how many women that are pregnant could enjoy this podcast today and this podcast would have helped them. Uh, the only way they're going to hear about it is if we are going to have a lot of reviews and um, a lot of shares. So please do that. It helps people such as yourself and like us to get more information about their skin health, about their overall health. Um, so even one word review greatly helps. But that's all we have for today. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you for having me. Thank and you, everyone who tuned in. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you here next time.